we're almost done with the uh, single core, uh, so we stopped the discussion of the Cindy uh, type uh, execution, Cindy type uh, instruction sets. Uh, there's special instruction sets for essentially processing multiple sets of data at the same time, and there are pieces of hardware, parts of the hardware that are specifically designed to handle such instructions. This is an example to demonstrate to you why it's important uh, on a particular piece of code. So this is a uh, particular type of architecture, Intel Core 2, again, older one. So the only thing that it supports is the SSC 2 type instruction set, where vectors are two elements long when we're talking about double precision. So these are theoretical peaks in 64-bit uh, execution mode for Intel Core 2. Uh, you can see that uh, basically you can issue two, two instructions, uh, unfortunately you can't, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there is multiplication unit, vector multiplication unit, vector addition unit, and they sit on different ports, so therefore they can execute at the same time. So you can have one floating point add and one floating point multiply either in scalar mode or in vector mode. What this means is that at most, your processor, assuming the latency of these instructions is hidden, right? You can execute two floating point operations per second. That gives you an idea of how many calculations, how many floating point operations you can do to multiply this by the clock frequency of your processor that gives you a theoretical peak, okay? In vector form, now, since you're doing multiplications, two multiplications and two additions at the same time, you're doing four double precision flops per cycle, so twice as much. Now this is an example where we can see um, the, uh, how a particular type algorithm maps onto the underlying hardware and the underlying hardware limiting the maximum speed that that algorithm can achieve. So this is a the Daxby type operation, A times X plus Y, where Y and X are vectors and A is a constant. We'll talk about this a little bit more later. Um, notice that every iteration of this vector loop, so think of you, you have sum over I here, uh, and I runs over the length of the vector. Uh, for every, in order to, to perform a multiplication and addition, so every iteration of the loop, you can do two floating point um, operations, but you need to load two numbers into the registers, x, y, and y, y. Now, a can be held somewhere in a register forever, so it doesn't need to be loaded. So you have two floating point loads and one floating point store. So you, therefore, you have three floating point memory operations, or three memory operations, for every two flops. Now the peak is two flops, so unfortunately the processor does not allow you to load more than two floating point numbers per cycle. This is a limitation of the processor. So you cannot, in principle, on the given processor, processor execute the Daxby loop at 100% efficiency. So the best you can achieve is probably something like 66%, maybe 50% of the peak. You simply cannot feed the SEC units with enough data. Uh, the situation for this type of kernel is uh, not any better nowadays. So this is a type of uh, algorithm that unfortunately is memory bandwidth bounded. We're gonna, in, in the second part of my lecture, we're gonna talk about different algorithms, and how they map onto the hardware. This is the first example of an algorithm that does not map well onto the hardware. The situation is a little different with DDOT and DJAM, and we'll talk about that. All right, now let's actually talk about what else besides uh, arithmetic logic units and memory is on silicon. So here's a quiz. Uh, whenever you see um, media releases by Intel and AMD, they, they say, oh, we, we have so-and-so, so so many hundreds of millions of processor, uh, transistors on the silicon chip. Where do you think most of those transistors go? <laughs> Memory is one guess. 
Yes. Who agrees with me? I agree with you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, most of it goes into the memory and other things. The execution unit, so this is actually the uh, die of the Intel Halem architecture, which is the second most recent architecture. Uh, and this is just one core. So on, on a single piece of silicon, you have multiple units of this with some additional silicon connecting them together. Uh, execution units only take about 20% of this. You have L1 data cache. You're going to have L1 instruction cache. You're going to have L2 cache and interrupt servicing. So there is some L2 cache on the, on the core. And then you have branch prediction, remember, I mentioned that. Uh, memory ordering and execution, instruction decode, all of these things that we have uh, mentioned before, they all take lots of transistors. So most of the transistors go into not executing instructions, but making sure that they can be executed well. Things like caches, branch prediction, and so on. So this is a, an actual chip die. This was execution core die, and this is chip die. So as I said, each of these is a core, uh, and you can actually recognize certain parts of it. This was an execution unit, and so it seems like it's in this corner right here. Uh, so you have four cores, and then you have memory controller that basically uh, is in charge of communicating with, um, well, assuring that data in caches of these different cores are in sync. You have shared L3 cache. That's where a lot of transistors are used. And then you have IO. Uh, that's communication to the other sockets on the motherboard. OK, so yes, indeed, most of the transistors are not in the actual execution modes. All right, summary about the cores. So modern cores by virtue of having multiple execution units and doing very smart things about how they can execute instructions such as pipelining and so on, they can execute instructions faster than the data can be fetched. So uh, hierarchical memory can offset some of these problems, pipelining and so on, but nevertheless, we essentially have run into the wall of improvements in this area. Uh, the further improvements are going to come primarily from reduction of the power usage, uh, the shrinkage of the features on the die, and so on. The more transistors can be packed into the same um, square inch of silicon, and so on. But we essentially have run of ideas of how to optimize. Now, vectorization, that's one area where things are happening. The vectors are becoming longer. Uh, you need to be aware of this. So therefore, since most scientific computation is not irreducibly similar to serial parallelization, such as vectorization, simply style parallelization. And then also, going beyond that to multi-core parallelization, uh, is our responsibility, but it can be done. We have enough parallelism in our tasks in order to do this. Uh, but however, the compilers are not perfect, and so therefore, you have to um, be involved in this as well, and that's why you're here. All right, going beyond single core. Now, you guys are going to talk more about this, but you have to be aware, sort of gen basic idea of the multi-core architecture. Uh, this is an idea, that this is basically a, a schematic of a multi-core processor. And again, what I showed here, this is what these different parts are. Most of them you really don't need to be aware of. Uh, in this case, we don't have L2 that is shared. We have L2 on each core, and then we have L3 that's, that's shared, but same idea, okay? Maybe some levels of, of the hierarchy, of the memory hierarchy have moved on to the core, but nevertheless, there's going to be some cache that's going to be shared uh, between the cores. So the cores can send the data directly in between. They can write into the cache. There's some hardware that uh, ensures that this interaction occurs uh, in an orderly manner. And then the cache is what connected to RAM. Uh, notice uh, that because we have shared caches, uh, then there are additional considerations that have to be taken into account. For example, uh, well, specifically cache coherence. 
Okay, remember, caches, all they do is they mirror the contents of the memory. So whenever, let's say we have two cores, uh, one of them, and both of them are holding the same cache line, and one of them is writing into it, somehow the content of that cache line, the, I guess the information that that cache line has been updated needs to make its way somehow into core one. The pieces of, of the hardware that actually do, that ensure this coherence are cache coherence units or cache coherence hardware. There, again, these are mostly for Googling, okay, Googling terms. Uh, I'm not gonna talk really about this, but the bottom line is this can be complicated, but it can affect your code. Okay, now multi-socket multi processors. So these are second to last generation. These are not, not the most recent, so since the Halo we have an additional Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge architecture, but the idea is similar. So you have, in this case, uh, we have L1 and L2 caches that sit on each core, and then we have L3 that's shared between the cores. This is a four-core uh, example in this case. So each piece of silicon has four individual cores that, that share some in, uh, infrastructure. And then, what happens to these cores? Well, these cores somehow are connected via this quick path interconnect in the case of Nihilum or in Barcelona via hypertransport as basically a means of communicating to the other sockets. In Intel Sandy Bridge, the similar idea, the QTI, you have multiple links here, but the same idea applies. Uh, here you have just more cores. Obviously the number of cores is gonna grow, likely to 16 and 32 and so on, and this complexity is gonna continue increasing. Now notice what happens here is we have RAM that actually is directly connected to the socket. So what this means is that you, if, if you say have um, 64 gigabytes of RAM into in your system, and it's a four socket, well, two socket system, and each socket has eight cores, you don't have uni uh, sort of uniform memory in your system anymore. As of now, the DIMMs are, the memory is gonna be connected directly to the processor. And so therefore, if we have another processor here, in order for it to fetch the data from here, it has to travel through the QPI, the Quick Path Interconnect, and so some parts of memory are gonna be eas more easily accessible than others. We are in the NUMA world now. Okay, so this is uh, sort of a big lie. The shared memory, when we call these things shared memory, the memory is not really shared. The reason it's called shared memory is it's technically shared uh, in a more direct way than it would be, say, in a cluster, but really it used to be shared when we had an individual memory controller that connected all different CPUs or all different sockets together they all had to go through the same bottleneck. The reason now we have memory that's connected to individual sockets is this thing is not scalable. There's a single source, there's a single bottleneck in the system. So now we have um, RAM attached to each socket, and this is a modern architecture, four socket platform, for example, uh, and therefore this is a non-uniform memory access architecture. We, we have different amounts of time, reading from this core, uh, this RAM versus this RAM versus this RAM, and so on. Okay, so don't assume that shared memory is easier to program. No, it's not. You really do have to be aware of things like that. Now, a little bit about GPUs. What are the GPUs? You'll learn more about them later on. Uh, think of them as basically massively multi-core machines with um, much wider SIMD units that you normally are dealing with, plus programming model is very different. So that all of these things combined make them quite a bit more difficult to program. Um, how many more cores are we talking about? So when I say massively many cores, uh, if you read literature from NVIDIA, uh, then they will say we have, let's say 500 cores on, on this piece of of silicon. Well, it's not really true. What they call cores are not really cores. 
Um, realistically, the way to, to view this is they, they can have up to, say, 32 cores or maybe more. And Intel Xeon 5, for example, has on the order of 50 cores. And each of those cores has really wide SIMD units. So in other words, there are instructions that can act on up to 60, well, 16 sets of data at the same time. So essentially, parts of the SIMD unit is what they call core, but really it's not. So 16 times 32, that would give you something like the order of 500. That's what they really call, call that. Nowadays, uh, I would say it's just a 32 core machine really wide uh, simply. Uh, they have relatively little cache, so if you look at the schematic diagram of what the actual, well, this kind of represents what the diet looks like, the cores actually take a lot more of well, the silicon than they do in the regular architecture. That means that there's less stuff around it to make sure that the code runs fast and becomes your responsibility, more of a your responsibility to uh, make sure that the code runs fast. The memory bandwidth, that's one advantage that the GPUs have over CPUs. It's much bigger memory bandwidth, although CPU have really caught up uh, to, are catching up to the GPUs. Uh, the biggest bottleneck, as you're gonna see, is that this sits on a bus that is connected to your CPU. And so there is a huge memory, whenever I say the memory bandwidth is huge, it means it's between the cores on the GPU and the memory on the GPU. The bandwidth between the core on the GPU and memory on the CPU is really low. And so if you can fit all of your data onto the GPU, then that's great. You can really see an improved performance. For example, if you have a memory limited, uh, memory bandwidth limited algorithm, which there are many of them, uh, you'll really see the benefit. But if you have to shuffle the data back and forth, that's going to be painful. And the problem, the biggest problem to me is that the programming models really are specialized, highly specialized, and the code really needs to be written specifically for the GPU. Some of you during the break were telling me, well, I mean, it's crazy programming with intrinsics or um, SIMD type um, instructions. Well, this is worse, right? Because this might actually go away. At least SIMD is gonna be around. This might actually merge onto the main silicon. It's gonna be on the board and so on. So it's likely that the programming models will change in, in the near future as well. So uh, there are lots of issues to consider when deciding whether to get involved in the GPU. But as you saw, most of the top machines nowadays do have either NVIDIA hardware on them, or Intel Xeon Phi hardware, which is similar in some sense to this. Uh, so there's a definitely some advantage to jumping into the, this game. This is a, a sorry for uh, imperfect quality here, but this is basically a scan of a page out of a book on computer architecture that actually compares GPU and CPU, and basically um, it dispels some of the rumors about, um, or I guess lies about GPUs. Specifically, it, it, it talks, uh, this table compares, I guess, the GPUs and CPUs in terms of the same language. So you can see that uh, this, these are not very recent machines. This is uh, hardware from late 2009, uh, but nevertheless, this is a NVIDIA Fermi, which is the previous generation of the GPU architecture. And this is Nihalem, uh, so the previous generation of Intel architecture. Nevertheless, you can see that the comparison, that the reason that GPUs are much faster is they simply have many more processing elements. Now, the number of cores, what we call cores here, again, are the units that have really wide SIMD units. So whereas in, sing in double precision, this processor only had SEC2 instructions where vectors were two elements wide. GPUs have 16 element wide vectors. Okay? So the amount of data parallelism in your application needs to be significantly greater. You can't just be reading data at random out of memory. You really need to be accessing memory so that 
At least 16 elements are accessed at the same time. And single precision, that's even worse, by the way, because now you have 32 uh, elements that fit into the vector. Notice that the actually comparison in, in terms of transistor count and the power actually is very favorable for the GPUs. And the reason why we're able to build such huge machines with them is uh, you have four times as many uh, processing elements. Actually, uh, that's about a factor of four as well. There's, there's actually not a significant uh, increase, but the power per, per the chip is actually uh, roughly the same. So they indeed do more computation per watt than regular CPUs. The peak, the peak performance, you can see that uh, if you do regular code without uh, fuse multiply adds, you have four times as many cores and you actually can do five times as much work in double precision. So it's actually not out of the ordinary. There's really no magical, nothing magical about what GPUs do. Um, it's just simply having many more cores. And you do have to do more work in order to fill those really long, much longer, much wider vectors with them. Okay, so the peak is indeed much higher, but uh, not significantly so. Okay? Uh, this is, let me get back to the slide when we talk about algorithms. This just shows that it's much easier because of the much higher memory bandwidth. You actually can run algorithms that conventional CPUs cannot run very, very well on the GPU. It's much easier to get to the peak, peak speed. We'll, we'll see that when we talk about vector uh, algorithms. Distributed memory multiprocessors. That's the last thing uh, I'm going to mention. Basically, now that you have a node and it's got really lots of cores in it and some complicated uh, hierarchy of memory, um, how do you increase the number of cores in the machine? Well, you run out, you basically have to just physically connect them together. Stack them up into, into a rack and then stack the racks together and connect them using some sort of an interconnect, which is basically just a network. Now think of each node essentially as an individual machine. They're all connected by some means, but each node has its own cores, it has its own memory, and so therefore, in order to express a computation uh, that spans multiple nodes, you really have to deal with the idea that now you have memory that is basically not directly accessible uh, from one node to another, and so on. So programming this machine is gonna be significantly different, and you're gonna be dealing with uh, a programming model called message passing interface, which is very different from the way we program individual nodes. Uh, a little bit about well interconnect networks. There are many of them, and I'm not going to mention because I'm not primarily because I'm not really sure what will need to be mentioned. Uh, maybe multi-dimensional forests or something like that. These are very primitive networks. Uh, the modern networks on the machines typically involve some sort of a high dimensional torus uh, network uh, that connects the nodes. Okay, so just a little bit about technology. So uh, you guys have probably heard about the InfiniBand. Uh, it's not really that different from the technology that links up your laptops in this room. They all connect it to a, a switch somewhere, a wireless switch in this case. Uh, and it's probably not gigabit Ethernet. If you connect it directly to the wall, then you would have gigabit Ethernet, and that's pretty much uh, com commodity technology at this point. Extremely cheap, and every uh, computer, including laptop, includes a gigabit Ethernet card. I remember we used to actually buy them separately. But uh, the reason it's not appropriate for high-performance computing is its latency and the bandwidth. They're pretty small. So, uh, sorry, latency is large and the bandwidth is small. So, um, remember I mentioned for the GPU, the bandwidth from the memory to the processor is, say, 100 gigabytes per second. Well, this is three orders of magnitude less, right? So, it's a huge hit. It's like going from memory to disk. 
they have the same order of magnitude. Latency is also large. Remember, I was talking about latencies of instructions within the um, processor being on the order of, let's say, between one and, and um, 50 or something like that, some clock cycles. Well, here we're talking about microseconds. So how many clock ticks is a microsecond? Around 3,000. A few thousand. So we're talking about latency, the amount of time it takes to send the message and the message arriving on the other end, not even being seen by the actual program, but just seeing, being seen by the hardware on the other end, uh, on the order of, say, a million cycles, which is significant. A lot of time, a lot of stuff can happen. InfiniBand is much better. Uh, these are Older numbers, you can get much higher bandwidth. Uh, you can get higher bandwidth, not much higher bandwidth, by having multiple links. Uh, but this is a typical number. Let's say you're at least an order of magnitude better than a gigabit Ethernet, uh, maybe a factor of 50 or something. Latency, this is typical. You'll, you know, latency is going to be, again, uh, lower by you know, an order of magnitude compared to gigabit Ethernet. And it costs relatively little. Costs really have come down. Um, now, the big machines, they're typically going to have proprietary interconnects, and they're going to have significantly increased bandwidth. But it's not the kind of stuff that you can buy off, off the shelf. So this is an open standard. You can buy hardware from multiple manufacturers. This is just great. The same thing for a blue jean uh, machine. It's going to have its own interconnect. They're all going to be roughly having latency of on the order of one microsecond. Okay, better than InfiniBand, but not an order of magnitude better. And they're going to cost significantly. All right, we're, we're done more or less. Uh, code optimization. So we have really gone all the way, starting from the abstract model of of a computer, and went all the all the way from how to make a single core fast, and what, what actually happens when the code runs, uh, to how to bundle these codes cores together, and what kind of issues for you as a programmer, and also someone who designs an algorithm, uh, what kind of issues come up. So clearly this is not trivial. And we don't, the goal of this workshop is not to make you an expert in any of this, but to give you an awareness of what it would take to be a true expert. And it will take many years, but you need to start early. So right now, if the best choice is if there is already a library out there that is highly tuned and portable, um, and you can express your algorithm in terms of that library, then that's great. And of course, linear algebra is a lot of what we do, but not everything that we do. If that's your case, then use vendor expert provided libraries. Whenever you write code where the innermost loop and the time sensitive piece of code is written by you, then you're really going to have to be aware of these issues. Uh, at least memory hierarchy. Memory is really the most important thing. Um, optimizing for cache and so on. So uh, we talked a little bit about a history. So the limit of instruction level parallelism, the amount of parallelism that you could squeeze out of individual instruction by chopping it into smaller and smaller units and doing pipelining on it, that's what pushed us towards data and instruction stream parallelism. And that's not where we are in the world. Uh, instruction stream parallelism was first, and then data, again, the SIMD type vectorization, that's really where um, things are happening. Uh, the responsibility for recovering this type of parallelism uh, is on you. The compiler is going to help you, certainly, but there is no auto parallelizing compiler. Now, vectorization, uh, SIMD vectorization is one thing, but there is no compiler that will split up and, and uh, write an MD application for you, at least not a uh, general purpose compiler. So, what the future is going to bring is more and more cores. They may become even slower, primarily because of power. Um, you can 
for the uh, clock speed, and I think power is something like quadratic uh, function of that. So you really do gain quite a bit in terms of power. That means it's going to it's going to be slower, but you can pack more of them. Uh, you're going to have wider and wider synergy. We're already seeing that. So as of two years ago, basically uh, general purpose processors from x86 family are all four wide uh, synergy and double precision and eight wide and single precision. And Xeon Phi, it's already eight eight wide, and that's going to come to the desktop and to your laptop as well. So we're all going to be living swimming in, this, in these wide synergy lanes. Uh, memory hierarchy, hybrid architectures, all of this is here. Uh, it's not going anywhere, and it's going to become more complicated. So get started early.